prior to that, have a PhD in computational neuroscience from, from Oxford. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit today around um, my experience in building machines, um, but with the people in mind. So when we build data science teams, I think there's a lot that we haven't yet kind of worked out in the way in which to do that most efficiently and most effectively, both in terms of making sure it's sufficient for the company, but also making sure it's right for the people. So um, I don't think we've, we've yet achieved that um, where I work, but um, I'm going to talk a little bit about that today. So just briefly, um, I work within the foreign exchange business at Citi. Um, Citi is a large American bank, for those who aren't familiar with it. Um, we have thousands and thousands of clients, which <clears throat> is a lot, but depends on your business, right? So if you're a web scale business dealing with millions of customers, thousands of clients isn't that much. Um, but it's a lot for us. And so we're dealing with lots of different assets. So an FX asset is like the euro dollar exchange rate or an interest rate. Um, and our business is very large. We do five and a half billion dollars of revenue more than um, each year. But one of the complexities that comes with such scale um, is the fact that we have to be in lots of different places at once. So we're in 70 countries, more than 70 countries physically. We have 77 trading desks, but obviously we're one firm. And um, I even think we're in over, well over 100 jurisdictions. And we facilitate $4 trillion of notional um, trade every day. So we're kind of in the, in the, in the middle. And um, I think that when we've been thinking about building a data science team, um, my role now um, is a little different to what it was when I started. And so when I joined Citi, I, I joined as a technology manager. Um, I was managing teams of around 80 to 90 people. And we were managing um, all of those dollars that flow into the bank, flow into the FX business. They all have to be risk managed. And that's kind of bread and butter of what we do at Citi. And so every one of those dollars touched one of my risk systems, because I used to run um, the risk and data platforms. And that was a very interesting role. Um, it has a lot of distributed computing. It has pockets of high performance computing. Um, but I think that the, the, the emphasis in the firm has moved or has continued to grow from risk into how we use data and all of those trades and all of the interesting insights that we have from those trades to better serve our clients. So in order to do that, I moved about a year ago to join um, the front office trading business. I report directly to the global head of FX there. And I have the role of um, leading our data science efforts. And my remit is to basically build that capability. And in doing so, I sort of referred back to my, my responsibilities as a technology manager, leading different teams, and trying to understand how best to build a machine learning and data science team in what is a very large business, which hopefully I've, I've conveyed. And so in order to build a data science team, we kind of have to agree on what it is, right? So simply put, in my opinion, it's just making better decisions with data. And to kind of put this into context for our business, like traders sit there and salespeople all day long making decisions based on their experience. And the best traders who have decades of experience remember what it was like in 2008 and remember what it was like when the client came one month ago or one week ago and knows what that client wants to do. And so they're able to, to serve the client well because they understand the client's behavior and they, they understand the market dynamics. But all of that data is in our system somewhere, right? And I would say that those systems were not necessarily built with data science in mind. They were built to have a trade, have that trade get booked, have that booking flow through to the middle office from the front office into the back office and eventually get settled. And that's when the actual transaction takes place from a kind of swift or IBAN standpoint. So when we then think about data science teams, well, how do they fit within, within this huge existing and fairly complex ecosystem of technology? And so you know, data science already combines business intelligence. If you work in BI, it was a common commonly coined phrase, um, really you're, you're putting data in front of decision makers. But perhaps you yourself are not making the decisions. That's, that's kind of a BI in a nutshell, whereas data science or decision science could, could be a subset where you're maybe doing something like customer seg segmentation. You're actually com coming to some sort of insight. Um, so for us, that might be um, a hedge fund is, is a different type of client from a, um, a corporate client which is a different type of client, again, from a real money client, like a pension fund. And so sales will work with these clients all day and, and cat categorize them. And those categories are part and parcel of how we think about um, our users. But perhaps a better way would be to use decision science to automatically classify those clients, to look at how they behave. And, and maybe we discover that a hedge fund tra trades more like a real money client, or a real money client trades more like a hedge fund. And that might have some interesting insights into how we cover those clients, into how we, how we choose to do business with those clients. But of course, how data science looks for you will depend on your organization. And we'll, that will take different shapes. And we'll talk a little bit, little bit about that in a minute. But the, the one key thing that I'm going to come back to um, a couple of times is the culture. 
and how you've grown. So City's grown through acquisition. City um, has, you know, just in, just in the technology teams that I used to manage, we were in New York, London, Israel, Chennai, Pune, Singapore, et cetera, like global presence. And it's hard to have one single culture, right? So when you're building a data science team to span across these functions, how do you make sure that that data science team doesn't get lost in, in, the, in the bigger picture? So moving on, um, structuring a data science team for me, the first thing you have to think about is where it aligns. And that might be very obvious for you if you're a technology first company, the technology is the business, maybe you're shipping technology pro products, then your business and technology are one of the same and your data science team can, can align very easily maybe to a chief analytics officer or even to a CTO. But for us in a firm that you know, only maybe 10, 10 years ago, traders were relying on Excel and what was in their minds to, to make decisions, um, the business and technology are, are fairly separate. And we have quantitative analysts who sit in that picture and sort of create the third leg to the stool. Um, and then of course we have other central technology functions like data center teams and central technology. And so if you're gonna build a data science team, do you wanna align it directly into the business? Maybe to set the, the tone? Do you wanna align it in technology? If you put it into technology, you're gonna be able to benefit on all of the hard work that the existing technology team have already built. You're gonna be able to upskill existing technologists. I mean, at the end of the day, data science is a relatively new field and there'll be plenty of people in your organization that can migrate from technology into becoming a data scientist. So where you place it is, is interesting. I think a lot of people choose to have a dedicated function. And my only concern with a dedicated function is that in some ways they're an outsider. You've got existing products, you have existing people, you have existing teams, and now you have this new shiny data science team on the side, they're gonna come in and solve all your problems. And what about if you're in the incumbent technology team and you wanna be a data scientist, how do you think that will make you feel? And so whether or not you choose to have a dedicated function is really up to your, to your decisions and, and your business, but I think um, it really breaks down and there's a, a nice um, article by Accenture, but um, really, they've, they've just summarized the fact that you can sort of have centralized and decentralized, and they look at it in different ways, but um, the center of excellence model is quite popular, um, and that's sort of um, where you might have a group of people, maybe physically separate um, to the rest of your organization, that work in an environment where they can share ideas with one another, and they're solving disparate dis business problems across your domain. Um, or they can act as consultants. They can come in, they can focus all their energy on one problem, they can leave some knowledge in their wake, and then they'll move on to the next problem. And I think this can work, but I think there are obviously some challenges with this. And then you have the decentralized model where you might have something that's federated or, or functionally aligned, where you have some data scientists embedded directly with the existing team. And they'll work with the existing team, help the existing team understand the problems, and they'll stay, they won't go anywhere. If that team's doing a big enough problem for you that can add enough value, then you'll want that team to continue to grow. And you want more people in that team to understand what data science really means. And so, I think both ways can work, um, and I think what we're seeing um, within my organization is a little more of the latter, a little more decentralized, where you're placing data scientists into existing teams. But the one key thing that we've sort of seen in going about doing this um, work is that you still need a culture that spans across business lines or functional lines, where data scientists can still come together, whether or not you have matrix line management or, or not, that's, that's kind of up to you, but making sure that your data scientists feel like they belong to a collective, even if they're um, located in, in different teams. So um, Jennifer Prenke, who used to work at Walmart Labs, um, I listened to a, a nice blog, well, um, I guess a podcast with her on Twimmel AI about a year ago, and I think she hit on, on a number of important roles um, that, that really resonated with me. And so I'll just quickly run through um, what, what I'm showing here. And one key thing to remember, these are roles, they're not people. If you can find one person to do them all, great, good for you. Um, it's kind of tough, but if you, if you think about these as roles, you can have people do more than one or, or share some responsibilities. But fundamentally, when I chase down the problems of performing good data science, they inevitably go from right to left, or maybe from data science to data engineering. Uh, and we'll talk about that in a little minute. But <clears throat> on the left, you have the data engineer, and usually that's a technology function, right? That's someone who is building um, on top of your Hadoop cluster, working with Hive, or maybe you're using Kafka and you've got some real-time flow. They'll know where everything is, They'll know who to talk to when you don't know where it is, and they will, they'll be able to get the data to the SA. In this example, the SA is a statistical analyst. Now, I think the phrase statistical analyst is probably, um, I don't know, there could be a better phrase for it, but really the sentiment about what that person does is look at the entropy and the data, the variance, they understand the business problem, and they're able to join the two. Now, they're not necessarily gonna know lots about data engineering, and they don't necessarily need to know about 
high parameter tuning, picking the right model, and so on and so forth, but they will know the problem. And you need that role, because if you don't have the problem well defined from a business perspective, you won't know which data to get, and then you won't know whether that data has the information in it, just at a very basic statistical sense, to be able to answer your question. So then the data scientists, I think that's a role that we all are some, somewhat familiar with. So whether or not you write your own models, whether or not you're doing your own stuff from the ground up, whether you're taking stuff off the shelf or using as a service type platform, you do need to iterate on your model development and you do need to um, have someone doing that function. And maybe that's one person, maybe they're using a lot of great tooling, maybe it's 10 people, maybe it's 100 people, it really depends on your scale. But finally, you need to put that model into production and <clears throat> I'm gonna talk a little bit, about, little bit about that because that's a very important component to the well-oiled machine. But in finance, there's, a, there's an existing corollary which, which I like to think about when we talk about the machine learning engineer. And that is the low latency C++ or low latency Java engineer that's already writing highly performant code that sits at the edge of your network and co-locates with other servers, perhaps an exchange or a single dealer platform in our case, um, but it could just be your customers. And so sometimes you need these highly performant models and the machine learning engineer may not really be the right person to do the statistical work around working out which model is the right model, understanding the explainability as we heard about before. But they will be the person who can scale it if you need the scale and make it fast if inference is an important part for what you do. So I'm just gonna whiz through these slides. I think everyone's very familiar with um, you know, the flow of a data science problem and I think we can all agree that you spend a lot of time um, feature engineering. And for me, this like, really kind of hit home because you, know, you can get a lot of auto feature engineering um, tools um, and, and H2O are great at that, but I think that <clears throat> sometimes they're unique to your business. Sometimes um, you know, your data that you use to create the features is not in the right shape. Sometimes it's not even there where you need it to be. And so you spend a lot of time working on that problem. And when you chase down the blockers to doing good data science and you keep going upstream, it's gonna be because you don't have the data in the right, I, I just quality, I guess. And so, you know, your data strategy for building this data science team is a prerequisite. And you could spend a lot of time hiring really smart people who wanna do maths and statistics and work in carers, whatever it might be. Um, and actually they end up really being data engineers, which is, in my, my opinion, equally if not more valuable of a role in your flow, especially when you don't have it sorted already. And lots of companies don't have that sorted already, including parts of city. Um, so without the core data infrastructure, it's really hard to perform production ready data science and get those models deployed. I think a lot of time was spent on building the data lake and, and the Hadoop kind of um, phase has, has come and, and we're there, but if, you're, if your data's all in one place, that's really useful but if it's not in one place real time, how are you gonna do inference? And so I tend to like try and avoid letting people work on modeling that they can't put live in production because the features or the data isn't streaming live. And you know, on the other side, you might say, well, actually, if we can find something in the data that worked in a batch offline research environment, that can be the impetus to doing the work to get that data live. But really, I think that they're, they're two separate things. You, you need to be thinking about your, your real time stream processing, basically. Um, and again, um, I think it's not about the speed, it's not about the volumes of data. We can cope with that, right? We, we have the cloud now and, um, and so on. But I think it's more about the diverse data sets that we have um, and the different sources of data and, and unifying them. Um, and it's natural, right? Like, it's very normal to have lots of different sources of data and it's also very normal to store them in different databases, right? There's nothing wrong with having a copy of your data in a graph database and a copy of your data in a relational database and another copy in a key value store because you need it to serve different use cases. It needs to be fast for what the application requires, but how do you keep all those things in sync? And if you don't, where does your data scientist team go to, to work on the problem? Like, which one is the golden source of the truth? If you don't have it at least real time, one place centrally, um, it's gonna be very hard to, to answer that question. And um, in large companies like ours, um, you, you see situations where teams are handing off data to other teams um, SFTP file transfers or um, whatever it might be. And it's, it's, it's very hard to actually then know like who owns the data. And if that data changes later and you're like a third hand consumer of this data, um, how do you know that it's not gonna affect your model? So there's one, one very simple stylized um, point I just wanna make here. Uh, and that is like if you, from an architectural standpoint, not from like an in, within the database standpoint, we can, we can talk about that after. But you know, if you've got an application producing data, like 
it may write data to one front office in our case, like store of data, which a trader and salesperson is using. And that data is always right, because I tell you what, when something is wrong and a trader is trying to rely on it to, to do their job, they will shout and scream until it's right. And support will, will come in and make that fixed, get it, get, it, get it fixed. But if it's been publishing somewhere else, you will be in a situation where that other thing becomes, becomes stale, and then you need a daily recon. And in some poor, hopefully not, data scientist is gonna do a daily recon for you instead of doing data science, and it's not a fun place to be, right? So you need an architecture natively in your data fabric that's gonna make sure that these things stay in sync. Um, I've called it the data highway here. It could be, could be Kafka, it could be whatever, whatever it is for you, but that's important because then it becomes much easier to republish the correction, make sure everything, um, every, every listening system, every database has a copy. And so when your data scientists come to work on it, they don't have to worry about what is the golden source, and you're gonna save a lot of time and tears um, on that one. Engineering for data science. So, um, you know, you've probably read a lot about what Uber are doing. You've obviously um, got other companies in this space. But I do think that once you get the team and once you have the data and once it's all flowing, you have a lot of extra work to do that maybe your business stakeholders or your, um, your execs don't necessarily appreciate that there's going to be some technology work for technology in a way that's not necessarily going to be shipping a product or, or helping you gain insights. So, for example, um, you know, you've got this model, you need to put it live, but everything that the model consumes needs to be auditable. That might be a regulatory reason, or, or it might not, but it should be, either way. And everything that it produces needs to be auditable, it needs to be monitored. And monitoring isn't just like CPU cycles and RAM and disk space and all the traditional things that we, we all have if you've got existing systems. It's, it's a superset, right? It's, it's more than that. You have to look for drift. You have to look for different accuracy measures. Maybe you've even gone so far down the, the path of your data science journey that you have a separate team whose job it is to audit models in production without talking to the original team that made them so they can be impartial. Are you actually doing the right thing by your customers? Are you optimizing the right cost function? Are you really optimizing lifetime value or were you just optimizing that single deal and they never come back because you overpriced them? So you've got lots of things that you want to monitor um, and, and that can't be an afterthought, right? So um, that's very important. Um, but if you then want to scale a team, right, features, which is just data that have been transformed, um, need to be reproducible, and they should be shareable. So if you already have a really great data fabric with lots of good um, discoverability, you have a great data, you have a really good schema registry, then it's gonna be easy for you to just think about features for your models is just another, in my case, time series, or just another data set but they need to be um, in a place which data scientists can use them, right? So if you've got one team, we talked about having like a, a culture of um, matrix data scientists that will come together from time to time and discuss their problems, even if they're in functional silos. One guy says, oh, I've, I just built this really great feature. It was really useful for my model. It uplifted by 2% accuracy. And then the, the, another data scientist, she says, well, can I use that feature? Um, and if you haven't had a way to store down that feature, keep it maintained, and have it versioned, because if the original owner of that feature who's been producing it and publishing it decides that they want to tweak it or change it, which is completely reasonable, um, maybe they need to have some SLA around keeping the old version live, having a new one coming in, and, and maintain both for some time. After all, storing data is cheap, so that, that shouldn't be a consideration. So I think there's a lot of extra work to be done in terms of making sure that your data science teams have what they need to be productive and be happy. Um, and then finally, you know, DevOps is really important and, and it has an important place in my heart because you know, the better your DevOps team and, and how you choose to deploy your DevOps is again a whole other discussion, but you know, if you have good DevOps for your data scientists, deploying new models is just simple and easy. So in conclusion, um, I think that data science isn't an afterthought, right? We, some of us, especially if you've come from a big company, you, you arrive and you think, I've got to catch up and we've got to be using statistics and data science to help make data-informed decisions. You know, let's have this new team and, um, and you, you've really got to rethink that. I think you've got to think about how it fits with what you have. I think you have to think about roles and responsibilities in, at your senior level so that the right message is sent down that this is people working together, not working against one another. You're not bringing a data science team in to crit criticize and find um, problems with what you have before it's to help, right? Um, you don't need to hire a team of unicorns that can do everything, right? You know, I work with some interesting data scientists, um, both within City and, and outside of City, and you know, 20 years of experience, and data, data engineering has changed a lot over that time, and you know, they, they still consider themselves learning all the time, and they need to stay focused on data engineering to be really good at that job. So how are you gonna find someone who can do data engineering and then also have the experience of understanding the nuances of building a really deep neural network? 
if they haven't had the opportunity to invest those, those literally raw hours just to build it up, right? Um, and so, you know, you have options. Do you want to do that yourself? Do you want to, do you want to invest in someone who, who can do all of these iterative um, experiments? Do you, want to, do you want to pay? Do you want to pay to have someone help you with that? Do you want to pay for software to help you with that? And how you choose to divide that problem and how you choose to hire is going to depend on your scale and your appetite and your budget. You know, you know in my case, Everyone thinks banks have loads of money um, to invest on these things, but that money is well documented and, and well allocated. And every time we want to do something new, it's an incremental ask, and, and I have to go and fight to, to get that ask, as, as in any company, right? So I think how you spend your dollars is critical, and you know you'll make decisions now that you won't realize the implications until two years, two years from now. And finally, when you chase down your roadblocks, um, you know you're always taken back to your data, and so don't rush to to build out huge data science teams or just hire blindly. You know, talk to existing incumbents, talk to people that know a little bit about the space that you're, that you're wanting to build, and check that your data and your data fabrics fit for purpose. And if it isn't, you, know, you can do the two in parallel. Right? You, can, you can improve one, but don't promise a, a, a data scientist who's coming to join your team that everything's ship shape when it isn't, because it's just going just gonna to burn you hours and everyone's going to be upset. So, these are some of the lessons. Uh, by, all means, by no means do I have all of the, the answers, but they're just some of the observations that I've, I've seen as I've, as I've moved from trying to build technology teams to, to building data science teams. And I think that um, there's a lot more still to learn, and especially um, around model deployment. But that's it from me. Thanks for your time. Thanks for listening.